and end. The next item on the agenda is concerning the presentation of the Court of Auditors Annual Report for 2021. I'd like to turn to the representative of the Court of Auditors and the representative of the Commission and welcome you both. And first of all, I give the floor to Tony Murphy. Good afternoon, President, Honourable Members, Commissioner. It's an honour for me to be here today for the first time as the newly elected President of the European Court of Auditors. My focus as, pre as President will be on continuing our work to support this House with the information that you need to fulfil your role and to improve accountability and transparency across all types of EU action in the interests of our citizens. However, today I am also here before you in my previous function as the member for our annual report for the year 2021. My colleague Jan Greger, who has taken over this function following my election, is here with me today. Our annual report is our core product. It contains detailed information on the results of our financial and compliance audit work that support our key messages on which I will focus today. As in previous years for the EU accounts, we adopted a clean opinion in other words, they were not affected by material misstatements. On revenue, we found that the overall error rate was not material. On expenditure, for the first time this year, we provide two separate opinions, reflecting that there are fundamental differences between budget spending under the multi-financial framework and that of RRF spending. Firstly, on EU budget spending. Based on our representative sample of 740 transactions, we found that the overall level of irregularities increased significantly from last year, reaching 3% in 2021, from 2.7% the previous year. And we estimated that it is 4.7% for the high-risk spending, which makes up a clear majority of our audit population, being 63% of that population. Given the widespread nature of the problems that we have found, that is the pervasiveness of the error, we gave an adverse opinion for the third year in a row. If we look closer for a moment on the different policy headings, we estimate that the level of error to be material for single market innovation and digital at 4.4% compared to 39 the previous year, and in the cohesion policy area at 3.6% compared to 3.5%. For natural resources, when taken as a whole, we find the error to be close to materiality although our results indicate that direct payments are below materiality, whereas rural development, market measures and other areas outside the cap are above materiality. Finally, for administrative expenditure, we estimate the level of error to be not material. So far, I have mainly focused on the compliance aspect of EU spending. However, making use of available EU funds is another area that we look at and which has regularly been an area where we raise concern. This has not changed in 2021. Outstanding commitments at the end of 2021 totaled 341.6 billion euros. This compares to 303.2 the previous year. However, this amount includes for the first time outstanding commitments in relation to the RRF of almost 90 billion euros. Excluding this amount, outstanding commitments actually decreased compared to last year, mainly due, however, to delays in the implementation of shared management funds under the 2021-27 MFF. Through our work in 2021, we also found suspected cases of fraud, and we have reported 15 such cases to OLAF, uh, compared to six in 2020. And from the information that we have been given, OLAF has so far opened five investigations. So beyond these individual cases that we transmit to OLAF and now also to EPO, the ECA tackles this very important topic through specific dedicated reports. Ladies and gentlemen, I now turn to our audit of the expenditure under the RRF. This is a novelty in our annual report this year, and as I noted when presenting our annual report to the CONT last week, it's an area of particular importance. And for that matter, I expect that it will continue to be in the coming years. And that's why I would like to express the Court's gratitude for the Parliament's support in obtaining additional temporary auditor posts in this year's and next year's annual budgets. 
The RRF regulation provides for a different delivery model than that for EU budget spending under the MFF. The RRF delivery model focuses on the achievement of milestones and targets, rather than the reimbursement of costs in court, which has implications on what makes a payment legal and regular. In this statement of assurance audit on RRF, we therefore have to focus on whether the Commission has gathered sufficient and appropriate evidence to support, to support its assessment that the milestones or targets were satisfactorily fulfilled. Compliance with other EU and national rules does not form part of this Commission's assessment on the legality and regularity of payments and is therefore not covered through this opinion. This aspect will be looked at through future audits when the Commission work in this regard has been completed and can be assessed. Furthermore, we do not assess the effectiveness of the different reforms contained in the milestones. Again, this would rather be a topic for future dedicated special reports. For 2021, the RRF audit population included the single payment of €11.5 billion Euros made to Spain following the reported fulfilment of 52 milestones, all of which related to reforms. Given that there was only a single payment, we had the opportunity to examine this in detail. We found that one of the milestones, in our view, was not satisfactorily fulfilled. This view, based on all available information and using our professional judgment, is that the impact, however, was not deemed to be material. While a number of payments to different member states have been made in the meantime, we are still awaiting a Commission proposal in relation to quantifying the impact of when a milestone or target is not satisfactorily fulfilled. President, Honourable Members, I would like to conclude and take this opportunity to thank the Commissioner for his institution's cooperation over the past year. We may sometimes differ on specific points, but together we both strive within our respective responsibilities to ensure that the EU's budget is put to good use. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to a good debate this afternoon. I'd like to thank the new President of the European Court of Auditors. I would like now to ask the Commissioner responsible to share with us the Commission's thinking on this. President. Particular. Dear President Tony Murphy, young Gregor, and the incoming uh, court member Lefteris Christophorus, uh, um, first I would really like to thank you and um, I can only um, um, reply uh, to you, Tony Murphy, and your team for the excellent cooperation also in preparing this uh, annual report uh, and the very good cooperation not only on this uh, subject, also on others. And I agree. Sometimes we might have different views and uh, analyses, but uh, it's always in a spirit of mutual respect, and this is something which I consider crucial and important. 2021 was again an exceptional uh, year for our budget. The European funds continued to play a critical role uh, to help citizens, companies, regions, municipalities, and member states to overcome the coronavirus pandemic and its consequences. In June 2021, Next Generation EU started its borrowing with a record demand. The Recovery and Resilience Facility, a brand new instrument, uh, was also set up in record time in a couple of months. Um, in 2021, the Commission assessed and endorsed 22 recovery and resilience plans following a very thorough assessment process. In 2021, the Commission dispersed already 50 4 billion euro in pre-financing payments to 20 member states, which helped kickstart the implementation of the investment and reform measures. The Commission dispersed a first payment for milestones and targets of 10 billion euro to Spain before the end of uh, last year. In this exceptional context, I am pleased that the EU accounts have received again a clean opinion. Likewise, I am happy that the Court concludes, like last year, that the revenue side of the EU budget is free from material error. The Court audited for the first time this year the recovery and resilience facility and concluded it was not affected by material error. Spending areas such as natural resources, which means primarily agriculture, 
and administrative expenditure continue to obtain excellent results. However, as you have heard, the Court has maintained its adverse opinion on legality and regularity of expenditure. Some areas, essentially the ones with complex eligibility rules, remain more prone to errors. The share of expenditure considered by the Court as higher risk has increased in 21 compared to 2020. This is uh, normal at this stage of the 2014-2020 uh, multi-annual financial framework and the delayed implementation of a lot of programs and projects. As a result, the overall level of error reported by the court slightly increased compared to last year. Another way, I have to say, to look at the findings is that 97% of the union budget is well managed. I would also like to underline that the implementation of the EU budget is not homogeneous across countries, regions, programs, or even types of measures. We are able to precisely identify and report transparently where the issues are, and we take remedial measures or ask member states and other partners to take actions. The Commission's conclusion as manager of the union budget is that the control systems are working effectively and the EU budget is effectively protected as a whole and over time. The multi-annual nature of our approach with controls even after payments allows the recoveries until the end of the programs. As regards the recovery and resilience facility, the Commission performs controls and audits throughout the spending cycle. When assessing the National Recovery and Resilience Plan, by checking that Member States have put in place sound internal control systems, by assessing whether milestones and targets are fulfilled before payment, and by performing risk-based ex post controls after disbursements. Finally, the Commission reports annually on the way European funds are managed in its integrated financial and accountability reporting. Through this uh, comprehensive reporting, the Commission assumes accountability and transparency on the management of the Union budget. At the same time, we are aware that areas of improvements remain and we are taking action. Firstly, simplifying rules remains the best way to prevent errors. This concerns especially the research program and cohesion policy. In cohesion, 75% of the errors are related to different interpretations or lack of knowledge concerning what is eligible and what not. Secondly, by strengthening our control systems to make them more effective, the Commission continues to extensively cooperate with the national audit authorities to improve the quality of their work. Thirdly, by supporting beneficiaries national authorities and other partners in the day-to-day -day management of union funds. For example, the Commission is providing support to Horizon Europe applicants through communication campaigns and workshops. All these efforts will continue as uh, the current MFF programs are now kicking off. Thank you for your interest. Thank you, Herr Kommissar. Thank you, Commissioner Hahn. Now we move on to the speakers from the European Parliament and I'd like to give the floor to the Chair of the Budgetary Control Committee, Ms. Monica Hohlmeier. Herr President, before I... President, before I start my official speech, President, Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Budgetary Control Committee, I'd like to congratulate Tony Murphy for having been elected President of the Court of Auditors and I wish him every success for the difficult task that he and his whole team in the Court of Auditors are facing in the future. We're looking forward to future cooperation because this annual report once again is a very important fundamental part of the uh, discharge. I'm pleased Mr Gregor is here as well uh, as he is also responsible for that report. Um, I'd like to just focus on the part where I'm rapporteur and restrict my comments to that. The second part on the Commission budget is something that Mr. Uh, Lenez and 
uh, others will be commenting on including the shadow rapporteurs. On the RRF, the Commissioner, I think, is well familiar with my very clear view. The questions that I've raised on behalf of the Budgetary Control Committee I'm pleased that DG Budge has, has shown a degree of flexibility in terms of the concerns that the Budgetary Control Committee has had. Our first concern is that we have these so-called milestones and targets, but they're so uh, general in their definition that to define whether they are satisfactorily achieved leaves so much latitude as to make it completely impossible as to know what is the standard for satisfactorily achieved let alone a methodology. You know, if somebody, a state, doesn't achieve five milestones, how important are they? How unimportant are they? What sort of percentage will be re reduced in terms of the payments made? At the moment, everything will still be paid, and the method methodology still doesn't exist. So we are clearly asking for this as Budgetary Control Committee. Secondly, there's no clear context here, no link between the level of payments of tranche, tranches and the achievement of milestones and targets. Then we have the serious problem that the member states establish lists for these projects and measures. They're meant to propose those, but they're not put to the Parliament and they're not put to the Court of Auditors either. Maybe they, we can see one or another, but we don't have them presented to us. That means the possibility for the Standing Committees in the Parliament, including the Budgetary Control Committee, to have oversight as to whether the projects are achieved, whether they've done what they're meant to do, where the money's gone. It's impossible. We cannot agree that we're satisfied with that. We're saying, well, the money's being paid out, but we don't know where. Thank you very much. I was extremely generous with Ms. Hallmeyer because the words of congratulation to the new president of the Court of Auditors was actually a, a very important point. I'm now pleased to give the floor to Ms. Isabel Garcia Munoz. Presidente, Comisario. Thanks, President. Commissioner, Mr. President of the Court, thanks to the, you for the presenting the 21 report. We're worried about the error rate, but over and above the percentages, what is necessary is to identify specific errors in order to solve the problems behind them. It's the first time also that the RRF has been audit audited, an innovative instrument which is based on milestones and targets. Spain's the only country that got a payment in 2021 after the favourable opinion of the Commission because it met all of the milestones, as Commission confirmed. Being top of the class sometimes means you get more scrutiny, but also it's useful for trying to move in anticipate the challenges for the future. What happened in Spain might happen in other countries where we have to see what happens when those cases occur. If we all work together, that might, I think, hope, uh, help us change and improve the handling of the European budget. Thank you. Olivier Castel. Mr. Olivier Chastel. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Président de la... President, President of the Court of Auditors, Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I'd like to thank the Court of Auditors for the quality of their annual report. I had the opportunity to say this last week in the committee. Obviously, this report has not quelled all my concerns. First of all, a very high rate, a rate when it comes to cohesion funds, the single market, the European Development Fund, but in particular high risk expenditure in which the uh, error rate is 4.7% this year. We then have an RAL which is also extremely high. You might say this drops if you remove next generation EU, but the figure is 341 billion, and member states' absorption capacity is extremely problematic both for the MFF and for next generation EU. Finally, the court underlines a lack of clarity when it comes to collection and the time frame. In the light of these factors, I must say I'm very concerned about upcoming years. Uh, Ms. Holmeyer just talked about the money which is spent as part of Next Generation EU, as well as within the EMFF. These are very large sums, and we are concerned about the future 
and the extent to which member states will be sufficient to absorb those large sums and how we will actually scrutinise that. Moreover, the Court of Auditors' first examination of the uh, Recovery and Resilience Facility does actually leave us with some doubts about ex-ante control and our objectives. Clearly, this fear is further exacerbated by countries such as Hungary, known for systematic shortcomings in the fight against corruption, uh, conflicts of interest and shortcomings in terms of public tendering. Finally, I would like to remind you once again the urgency to set up generalised tools for data mine, mining and the need to systemise the use of new technology and digital technology to optimise our scrutiny. The current situation is worrying. We have to ensure that we live up to the expectations of our citizens. We will only be able to do this if we have our accounts and our management in order. Dünn, als nächstes zu Wort gemeldet ist uh, für die Fraktion der Grünen Frau Viola von Kamon Taub Adel. Bitte. Frau Präsidentin, Herr Madam President, Commissioner, Ladies and Gentlemen. First of all, congratulations to the new president of the Court of Auditors. Our group is very pleased that you've been elected to. Given the next generation EU plan, we basically are looking at a two-fold of our budget. You've got the MFF and the RRF, which follow completely different rules, however. On the contrary to the MFF, the budget of the EU where payments are linked to responsibility, the RRF is subject to very general, predefined objectives and goals. There's a question of investments, but if we're dealing with two budgets which have de very different rules that need to be applied, the money cannot be appraised and subjected to similar controls. With the simplified rules, are we not playing into the hands of rent seekers such as Viktor Orban? Moreover, we need complete transparency when it comes to the use of EU funds, including the lists of those who are in receipt of cohesion and agricultural funding. For, exa for, example, for example, Mr. Babich, for his companies, he's received a lot of money for non-agricultural um, uh, activities. And how many of these Trojan horses are there throughout the EU? We need transparency, we need accountability, and we need a standardised way of dealing with EU funds. The objective has to be that each and every citizen can see at any stage in the process how much money is being spent by fr from taxpayers' reserves and for which goals. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe I could just point out to everybody else, keep to your speaking time. Our next speaker on behalf of the ID group is Mr. Joachim Kuhls. Thank you, President. Commissioner, Mr. Murphy, congratulations for taking on your new office. Unfortunately, we haven't had a chance to speak yet, but hopefully we'll be able to make up for that. I would like today just to say thank you. Thank you, first of all, that you have managed to display which I think were quite unjustified attacks from a French newspaper defended by some people in this House. I would also like to thank you for the annual report which we'll be debating today. For the third time in a row, the Court of Auditors has had to defend the fact that it has a negative opinion. That's not trivial. Commissioner Hahn, this is something you should take very seriously rather than simply trying to uh, swat it away. I would appeal to you to ensure that the recommended changes be introduced so as to uh, bring down this error rate. Finally, President, I'd like to thank you for the special report on COVID, in particular on the dubious question of the enormous procurement of vaccines under President von der Leyen. This report has stirred up a wasp nest. Lots of members have spoken out. Moreover, the European uh, public prosecutor is now looking into it. President, I wish you every success. I do hope you succeed in your job. I would call on you to continue to be ruthless in hunting down irregularities. Our citizens will thank you for that. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the Court of Orders once again for their work. We have our job to do. They have theirs, and that's the way it should be. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, for the ECR group... Richard Czarnecki. 
Madam President, President, Commissioner, ladies and gentlemen. Congratulations to the new President of the Court. You are taking this function in difficult times, in times where European taxpayers would be looking very carefully how European money is spent. So, my political group and myself, we hope that you are successful in your endeavors. I'm happy Commissioner Hahn is present here, is the most experienced commissioner here, which will certainly provide support for the court as well. It's been a difficult year for the EU and for member states. My thanks go to all employees of our audit bodies, so despite COVID, they were able to supervise the spending of European institutions. Please note that despite of the difficult time, the error rate was in general similar to previous years, just under 2%. I can also say what the results were for the audits in Poland. Namely, it's a little bit better than in the case of Germany and at the same level as France and Italy. Thank you very much. Good luck in your future endeavors. Thank you very much. The next speaker on behalf of the left, Luke Ming Flanagan. Um, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the first thing I want to do is uh, to congratulate uh, Tony on his appointment to this uh, very, very important role. And uh, I think it's brilliant that we have an actual auditor at the head of this organisation. And I think it's also very important that we have someone who comes from a working class background as our head auditor and the head of this organisation. Because when you come from a working class background, you don't say, ah, oh, well, I spent 97% of it well, and sure, 3% is only gone. Because if you do, you might not be able to turn on the light. Every last penny matters. And that's why I think it's important that we have someone like him in the position. And I really, really welcome it. On the RFF, we, RRF, we have a problem. The Court of Auditors have a, has a problem. We are dealing with ordinary people's money. However, exactly how this money is being spent is without any real auditable trail. The idea that national authorities can in effect audit themselves is a bad joke. As for milestones and targets, to me it's like having a unit of speed defined as stone throws, however long you can throw a stone, it's different for everyone, every so often, depending on how you decide every so often is. We need a massive improvement, but I think we've made a good start by appointing this guy. I think he'll make big changes. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. As next is to... Thank you very much. The next speaker for one minute, Nicolas B. Sur le budget annuel, il est temps d'avoir une discussion que la Commission... It's high time we had a discussion about the annual budget that the Commission's constantly been trying to avoid. The EU budget, Europeans' money, our money is being used to finance Islamism. At least 36 million euros paid out between 2014 and 2019 to networks linked to the Muslim Brothers or Hamas, where, where jihadist groups are supported. More than one million for so-called anti-terrorist programmes, which in fact are associated with NGOs founded by Abu Bakir Riega, who wants to establish a worldwide caliphate. This Islamism, this deadly ideology that's slowly poisoning our streets, our administrations and our schools. The same Islamism which is killing, which has, plunging, has been plunging Europe regularly into blood and grief. Each euro paid out by the Commission to these Islamist associations is a shame, a disgrace. It's vitally important that we have a complete orbit of audit of the monies paid out to the so-called anti-racism bodies and Islamophobia. We need to look into this matter, and you have to answer to the people if you don't. The next speaker is Jeroen Lenas. You have the floor. Then, President, let me first thank President Murphy for his presentation here today, but mainly also for the work that the Court of Auditors does in general. It's crucial work also in the context of our work here in this House on the discharge procedures. Now, on the annual report, I want to make three brief points. First, it is concerning that the court reports an error rate of 3% for expenditure, uh, which is well above the 2% materiality threshold, particularly because this error rate is increasing for the last couple of years, leading to an adverse opinion again. It is also significantly higher than the Commission's own calculated risk at payment, which now even falls below 
the range of error calculated by the court. And secondly, and this is connected to this, we should really work towards solving the confusion with different error frameworks used by both institutions. We need to know beyond reasonable doubt what the error rate is, and there needs to be an agreement on that figure. And the same goes for the assessments of the levels of risk of expenditure. Uniform methods for sampling, risk assessment, and corrections of errors and recovery would be very helpful for us also to do our work. Thirdly, the type of errors identified uh, over time remain relatively similar. Ineligible costs for beneficiaries, lack of supporting documents, infringement of rules, and breach of public procurement rules. Simplification of these rules would really help here also to make sure money gets without mistakes to the beneficiaries, and we need to work on that without delay. Public support for EU expenditures relies on our joint ability to spend European taxpayers' money in accordance with rules and regulations. And this report once again underlines that we still have some work to do. Thank you. Thank you, Shun. Uh... Thank you very much. Now I'm very pleased to give the floor to Ms. Lara Walters. Thank you very much. On behalf of the SD, congratulations, Tony Murphy. President, in the coming three years, via the RRF, there's an enormous amount of money that's going to be made available for the member states. That's all well and good, because in that way, Europe can help overcome the concerns of uh, citizens and to help deal with uh, bills looking to the future. But at the same time, you have to make sure that the RRF money is controlled and monitored, checked and overseen, especially where uh, the European Parliament has to have um, uh, the ability to see where this recovery money is going when it goes to Hungary, for example, and make sure that we know what's going on. There needs to be clear criteria for the release of RRF funds, who the final beneficiaries are, clear identification of them, and also this has to be made available clearly in a database. That sort of level of monitoring and control is essential so that everybody in the European Union can trust that we're doing the right thing. Thank you, Shun. Thank you very much. Thank you for keeping to the time. Next, we have David Cormon. You have the floor. Merci, Madame la Présidente, Monsieur le Commissaire. Thank you, Madam President, Commissioner. President, I'd like to congratulate you for your new job. Your task is an important one. In our democracy, we need to ensure that the money we spent be spent on the right things, the things we wanted to spend it on. This is of fundamental importance to the men and women who elect us and to whom we are accountable. The Court of Auditors and Analysts for the, for the MFF through to 2020, the 20% 20 of funding earmarked for climate wasn't respected. Only 13%, according to your studies, was actually spent on climate. This is unacceptable given the priorities we set ourselves for the energy transition. For the next MFF, 30% of expenditure should be for the climate, plus 10% for biodiversity. I know Commissioner Hahn has already responded to what I've said by saying there's no problem. However, I'd be grateful if, on an annual basis, we are able to verify whether we are still in line with our climate objectives, rather than having to wait till the end of the seven-year plan. So I'd be very grateful if you could keep a close eye on that. Nächstes. Thank you. The next speaker is Gilles Le Breton. Madame la Présidente. Madam President, President of the Court of Auditors, colleagues. The Court's report has seen an increase in suspicions of fraud in EU expenditure. 15 cases in 2021 compared with only six the year before. That's worrying. More generally, the report also looks at an error rate which is going up quite considerably, 3% compared with 25 before. This increase is all the more worrying than the fraud one, as far as I'm concerned, because it shows that there are collective mistakes and not just individual drifting. Let me give you the example of the anti-Covid vaccine purchase. The court openly accuses the Commission, and I quote, of not having checked appropriately whether the financial conditions for these contracts had been met. And we see with astonishment that the Commission granted blind 
confidence or trust in the vaccine manufacturers without checking into the exactness of their production cost or the use of the advances they'd receive, nor whether they benefited from secret non liability clauses. These are astonishing charges, and we can understand why on the tenth of March Parliament set up a committee of inquiry on to in the to the COVID nineteen pandemic. I expect that this committee will see whether these surprising errors are simply parts of serious negligence or whether they arise from conflicts of interest which are extremely reprehensible. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as Thank you very much. The next speaker is Johan van Overtveld. President, commissaris, we start. President, Commissioner, we're talking here about an important budget process, and the drafting of a budget shouldn't just be limited to allocating expenditure. We should also look at the quality of expenditure, both the pandemic and Putin's crazy war mean that we are now confronted with budget instruments which operate outside the regular EU budget. I support the need to release budgetary spending at times of need. At the same time, however, this confronts us with major risks. For example, the Parliament can no longer properly carry out its role of scrutiny. This applies both for Corona funds, the RRF, as well as for funding for Ukraine. There's no doubt that financial support for Ukraine is absolutely essential. But this m money must be spent with a view to achieving our stated objectives. And the ma majority of this should go to the co population of the country. The reality is that right now the European Parliament isn't able to verify what's happening. I'm in favour of strengthening the role of the European Parliament with a view to enhancing the fight against fraud and the irregular use of funding. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. The next speaker is Sabrina Pignalodi. Prima di tutto, complimenti per la sua nomina. First of all, congratulations on your appointment, Mr. President. Colleagues, the court's study on the financial situation of the EU shows how far we still have to go before we have a really effective and efficient budget. The court stresses that there are still too many mistakes in the budget, too many errors, particularly now when we have to ma manage all of the RRF expenditure as well. These conclusions show that the situation is very urgent and powerfully illustrate the need for efficient expense management, particularly in the light of the current recession. First, we had COVID. Now we've got the war between Russia and Ukraine and the worrying energy crisis with its increase in prices that it's bringing in its wake. The budget is rightly being increased because the EU, EU is mobilising and trying to provide more reflect flexibility in responding to the crisis. So when we need to come up with responses for our citizens and for our companies, errors in the budget need to be reduced as much as possible. And we need to do more to battle fraud and include also the recovery of money that was paid out incorrectly. Thank you. Uh, Angelica Winzig, as Öst Angelica Winzig from Austria is our next speaker. President. Thank you, President, Commissioner. Mr. President of the Court of Auditors, each year when we have the debate on the ECA report, we ask the same question. What's the level of the error rate and how much of that is uh, because of fraud or the lack of understanding of the way in which monies are paid out? Big companies have whole departments that exclusively deal with the application and and. Uh, administration of EU monies. But what about medium-sized enterprises who don't have that level of expertise? Some don't even submit requests because they can't m cope with the resources required to do that. But it also means we're missing out on a lot of potential. Hence, as the Austrian representative, Ms. Bergen Bergenau, in the Court of Auditors uh, said, and I can agree with this, we have to simplify rules for the uh, small and medium-sized enterprises so everybody can enjoy a level playing field and I'm sure this won't lead to an increase in fraudulent payments. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Ms. Caterina Kinici. <coughs> Commissioner, turning to you, Dr. Murphy, I'd like to congratulate you 
I'd also like to thank you for the annual report, which contains some positive valuations regarding the state of EU budgets and funds in terms of the balance of outgoing and incoming money. I am con worried, however, about the uh, error rate in the budget. And for the third rate in a row, there are concerns about this. At such a difficult time in which the war has created new risks for EU budget, it's even more important for us to be sure that EU funding is properly deployed. Moreover, it's important that the institutions, all the institutions, do their utmost to implement court recommendations as quickly as possible. We have to ensure that we introduce examples of best practice when it comes to member state controls. We also have to have ex-ante controls and improve monitoring of the rules regarding tendering. I would also like to thank you for a particular focus you've put on spending under the Recovery and Resilience Facility. These measures are of importance, uh, fundamental importance when it comes to supporting member states. Thank you. Thank you, Katharina. Now, Daniel Freund. Thank you, Frau Vorsitzende. Dear Thank you, Madam President. Yesterday, something surprising happened. 75 billion of Polish uh, cohesion money are frozen. And how did this happen? Not because of the Article 7 procedure that is blocked for seven years, not because of the conditionality uh, regulation that the Commission refuses to apply to Poland for two years now, and not because of the ECJ rulings uh, that the Polish government keeps ignoring to the tune of more than a million euro a day. No, it seems that a brave Commission official uh, applies properly the common provisions regulation which clearly says if you do not respect the fundamental rights and the fundamental rights charter, you cannot have money. And also when your control mechanisms break down, there should be no transfers. Mr. Hahn, of course, this should have happened much, much earlier. It's good that it is happening now. And of course, this shouldn't only happen when the member state in question fills out a questionnaire admitting itself that it's breaking uh, the rule of law. Mr. Murphy, uh, you should keep a close look at the Commission for properly applying those standards in, in all member states and protecting the EU budget. We have the rules, we have the instruments, and we should make sure that this is not just up uh, to the brave uh, civil servants, but that they get the full political support for upholding the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you. Als nächstes erhält der Abgeordnete Thank you. The next speaker is Bertian Rausen. Go ahead. Thank you, President, ladies and gentlemen. The recent findings from the Court of Auditors on EU expenditure really doesn't provide a rosy picture. The error rate of 3%, of course, is far too high. But the most concerns that I have are concerning the RRF, the Corona Assistance Funds, where there was no accountability that needed to be shouldered for the actual costs incurred. It was uh, just a set of sometimes very vague objectives that were established. And even if these weren't achieved, nevertheless, payments were made anyway. That's at least what the Court of Auditors said. Moreover, there is a lack of methodology to uh, measure how things have been achieved. And where does the money go? Well, it seems that society is not allowed to know because the be end final beneficiaries are not made public. This has to be changed. Let us make sure there's more transparency. When it comes to agricultural funds, every single final beneficiary has their name published. Why don't we do that with the RRF? When it comes to monitoring uh, the expenditure, we need to do things much better. Because when it comes down to it, it's about taxpayers' money, and we have to be very efficient when using that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Francesca Donato. Murphy, complimenti, commissioner. Congratulations, Mr. President, Commissioner. There's once again a negative view of the way the Commission ran its budget with a high error rate in various specific chapters. And the direct management of these payments for vaccines in the anti-COVID battle failed to respect the preliminary agreement's financial protocols, looking at providing, therefore, problems in the whole supply issue. The terms of the 
preliminary agreement needed to have been respected. The European Commission also looks at the question of loans to the Ukraine at high risk levels and talked about the ideas to try to re mitigate the problems of possible Ukrainian bankruptcy. These recommendations have exposed the European Union's budget to further losses. It's vital that member states allot more resources to deal with problems arising from the decision by a European Commission which has got no increase in correcting course and moving towards a more, more solid financial ground. If the Commission doesn't want to do it, we will have to draw the correct, distinct, the correct conclusions from that. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Ivan Stefanic. Thank you, dear colleagues. The findings of the Court of Auditors are very important. As a matter of fact, the results have shown that uh, the usage of the European funds has not been improving. In 2021, 15 cases of suspected fraud have been identified and reported to the European Anti-Fraud Office. Consequently, five investigations have already been opened. The suggestion coming from the comparison with the results of 2020 annual report were only six cases reported to Olaf. It really worries me. On the other hand, this report also shows positive outcomes. It shows that the Court of Auditors has been doing the, its work very efficiently and therefore I'd like to use this opportunity to express my gratitude for the hard and uh, honest work. Moreover, the report also emphasizes the high importance of the establishment of the European Public Prosecutor's Office. Nevertheless, when it comes to EU financing, we need to increase the powers of controlling mechanism. EU funds are, after all, assigned to European citizens for improving the quality of uh, life and simplifying their lives, not for enriching the individuals. Thank you indeed. Thank you. Our next speaker is Peter van Dauren. President, the European Union has been calling on citizens, companies, institutions to ensure that the money which they get from Europe be spent properly and in line with the rules. They're doing that quite rightly. What have we seen? The Court of Auditors has, for the third year in a row, rejected uh, EU payments, and the error rate has increased once again to 3%, well above the limit of 2 The error margin for cohesion funds is almost twice as high, and Spain and Greece in particular uh, uh, stand out when it comes to the number of errors. And we're still waiting for a full evaluation of the money spent on the COVID fund. So this is a worrying report. So the time has come for the European Parliament to bring an end to, these, to this development in the wrong direction. And we can't simply allow governments to deny this and slow this down. If we don't prevent them doing this, we lose our credibility. And taxpayers will say, what, what use are you lot? We simply can't put up with that anymore. Uh, Thank you, our next speaker, Mr Christoforo. Thank you, Madam President. Commissioner Hahn. President of the ECA, Tony Murphy, congratulations for your appointment and I am hopeful that you will further strengthen the court and will allow it to help European citizens feel that if we all work together we will have a series of institutions that are protecting the interests of our citizens. I was been a member of the Budgetary Control Committee and in the last few years with the contributions of all sides from the left to the right under the leadership of Monica Holmeyer managed to put a feeling of close cooperation, all of us working together, try to achieve one goal to make sure that the interests of European citizens were being protected and the court today working with our committee and with Commissioner Hahn have the chance to strengthen yet further 
are the confidence that citizens have in our institutions and in the EU in general. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sean Kelly. Thank you very much, President. First of all, I would like to welcome my friend Tony Murphy. Supportive Auditor, President, earlier this month. I warmly welcome you today, Tony, and look forward to your presidency. The 2021 annual report covers an immense amount of work and topics. This year, for the first time, the ECA covered the Recovery and Resilience Facility, the main component of the EU's 800 billion Next Generation EU package. The auditors have also outlined the key findings regarding revenue and the many areas of spending under the EU budget and the European Development Fund. One of the main purposes of the ECA is to highlight shortcomings in the management of EU funds. Last year was an extraordinary case where the EU took bold action in relation to common financing mechanisms. The work of the ECA ensures that risks and challenges for the EU's finances are managed effectively. It is vital for the function of the EU to have a full view of risks in relation to EU funds. Amour, Tony. I wish you all the best, Tony, in your future function. Thank you, Shun. Uh, Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. That brings us to the end of the list of speakers. We have two names on the Catch the Eye list, the first of whom is Claire Daly. Thank you very much, President. And Bulabos August Kogordikus. Congratulations to you, President Murphy. I wish you all the best. Ireland about wearing the green jersey, which basically means kind of going out and batting for Ireland no matter what. It's not a game that we ever choose to play because Ireland has plenty of shortcomings and we recognise them. But equally, we will call out our successes when they occur. And I'd like to put on record that it is a tremendous honour for Ireland that Tony Murphy has got this position. And actually, it's a tremendous honour for the ECA to have him at the helm of this key institution which doesn't get the focus that it deserves. I'd like to salute the work of the ECA in scrutinising how the EU spends its money in terms of whether our citizens get value for money. I often see its reports which points to our failings but yet we carry on regardless with much of those policies. I note the concerns in the report about the increase in errors. I note the President's concerns about the risk of the war in Ukraine on the EU budget and the massive transfer of resources that we have around this issue. So i just like to salute him and the organisation and hope that we work in this way with this organisation, which is evidence-based and so important at the present juncture. Thank you. The last speaker in the debate, Nick, Nick Wallace. Thanks very much, President. And uh, I too would like to congratulate Tony Murphy on his appointment to the, as President of the European Court of Auditors. And Tony was appointed by his peers. Uh, he didn't get elected by the usual in house trading. But then, uh, I, I find it interesting as well that uh, none of the Fianna Fáilers turned up here today. Tony comes from Ireland and uh, he didn't come through the political cartel that prevails in Ireland. And uh, he's from a working class background from Cabra. And for someone of his ability to reach such a high level in the European Union, it makes it a good day for the European Union. Now, uh, the Court, European Court of Auditors, for me, are one of the most reputable uh, entities in this institution, and God knows we don't find too many of them. Um, but uh, just on, on a couple of points, they did a wonderful report on Ukraine last year where they were investigating the value for money on 15 billion spent in Ukraine by the European taxpayers and found that Ukraine was one of the most corrupt countries in Europe. I now would like them, to, uh, but sadly that's been ignored uh, by the warmongers of late. Uh, and, and the last point, uh, we spent 8 billion in the Sahel since 2015. A total waste of money. I'd love to see the European Court of Auditors investigate value for money there. And lastly, on Mozambique, where I was two weeks ago, the. Um, the we did we some end the comment. <laughs> Please wind up. Herzlichen Dank. Thank you very much. 
it was lovely listening to you, but sometimes you, just, you obviously come to an end at some stage. Good, that brings the debate to a close. Commissioner Hahn, back to you. Thank you, Madam President. Just a few comments on what's been said. It is indeed correct that this year, to the tune of 90% of the budget, was deemed to be clean, even if some of that uh, appraisal might not always be uh, true. But, Mr Flanagan, after a major control period where several thousand checks were indeed carried out, the error rate was under 1%. So more than 99% was actually perfectly above board. And just turning to the public, I think it is important to recall the fact that when we talk about error and fraud, we need to make a clear distinction. In this case, when we're talking about the error rate, we're talking about mistakes, we're talking about the wrong assumptions as to what is entitled to funding and a very small amount that actually is down to fraud. But having said that, there is zero tolerance. If anything is discovered, uncovered, revealed, whether it be a mistake which needs correcting or if it, we're talking about an obvious case of fraud, then that has to be investigated, no holes barred. But if we're talking about error rates, then I can just agree with Ms. Vincig and others who said that when it comes to small and medium-sized enterprises, it is not very straightforward to apply for funding. And we have to admit there is a certain level of complexity to the structures involved. And I think our common appeal to all of us in this field is that wherever it is possible to avoid overcomplication, we should do that and bring about simplification. Now, Mr. Freund, nobody is refusing anything, but your example of Poland just proves how important it actually is to entertain a whole raft of measures in many different areas in terms of making sure that the rule of law is being observed and where which measure should be applied when it comes down to it does come down to the particular characteristics there. And so I think it was clear that in this area when we're talking about cohesion these were measures that were taken. My final point, I think once again if we consider the analysis of this, to be frank the error rate for me is an important indicator, but what's more important is the analysis of the Court of Auditors as to how they see, at regional or national level for example, when it comes to audits, where they see weak points, whether we then work together to address those points, and where we can find specific tailor-made improvements to make things right because then we'll be able to reduce the error rate necessarily. So that will be the focus. Look at systemic deficits, identify those, and then try to improve things from that point of departure. Thank you very much for the debate, and thank you also for the fantastic cooperation between the Parliament, the Commission and the Court. Uh, Herr Kommissar. Thank you, Commissioner. I would like now to ask Tony Murphy to wind up the debate. I would like to join those members who congratulated you and thank and hope that the cross-party uh, unanimity which prevailed in the House continues till next year. The future success of our institution are very much appreciated. Uh, from the contributions, it's obvious that ORF is, a, is an item of concern for many, many of you. Uh, I think, as I said in my introductory speech, that it's a particular challenge and one which is highly topical at the moment and will continue to be a challenge for us all going forward. I would like to just re-emphasise that what we say in our opinion is that the assessment of the Commission that the reforms in Spain have been uh, met 
and the payment can be made legally and regularly on that basis, that that is the limit of the opinion. We are not saying that uh, EU uh, national financial rules are respected. And in this case, however, because there's no investments, it's reforms in any case, so it's very difficult for us to audit anything in that regard because there's no associated costs, let's say. Um, but I think that I would look at RF in terms of being a work in progress, particularly in terms of how the protection of the financial interest of the EU will be protected. And I also see some need for a clarification in the responsibility and roles of the different players due to the novelty of this delivery mechanism. And there's also a need for us all, both us and the Commission, to ascertain on that basis if there are any accountability gaps. The second issue which was mentioned most frequently, I think, was the error rate. Uh, the Commissioner has said the error rate is, is just a snapshot in a way, it's just at a particular point in time. But nonetheless, I mean, it's, it's consistently around 2.5 to 3 percent. These are errors which are, uh, you know, repeatedly happening. So they're, they're, they're repeatedly happening. He mentioned about the um, control systems in the member states. If we look at the cohesion chapter, we see that the work of the other authorities there, we find a lot of errors that have not been detected by the other authorities, and therefore we can't rely on the work that the other authorities complete in terms of relying on the error rate. And the problem for us is this error rate that's reported by the other authorities is subsequently used by the Commission for their error rates. And this might explain to Mr. Lennart earlier why there's a difference between the Commission's error rate and error rate, because we, we still maintain that those reported from the national authorities are underestimated and are then subsequently incorporated in the Commission's error rate. However, I think it's also important to note that the 3% increase is probably in line with the trends normally towards the end of a programming period. Also, the fact that we have a higher proportion of uh, high-risk expenditure, as, you, as someone mentioned, the, the error rate for high-risk expenditure is 4.7%, and this obviously has an impact then on the overall error rate going up from 27 uh, to 3%. Um, I think someone also mentioned, uh, uh, Mr. Adam Vincic in that context mentioned simplification. As a court, we are consistently promoting the use of simplified, simplified cost options. Some member states use them more than others, but I mean, we are constantly behind that because we see that as a way of avoiding complex cost reimbursements, which we acknowledge all the time contribute to, to errors uh, systematically, I would say. Uh, Mr. Coos also re referred to the adverse opinion. The adverse opinion is because of the perverse, pervasive nature of these uh, errors. I mean, they're over 63% of our other population. They, their error rate is 4.7%, and that's why we're well above the 2% the uh, materiality threshold. I think Mr. Overtzfeld also mentioned something about these new instruments, and I think it's very important that we do look at flexibility of new instruments, but in a way that mitigates uh, risk to an acceptable level and ensures accountability. Uh, Mr. Chatel also mentioned data mining, which obviously, for, from our perspective, will be very beneficial and lead to efficiency gains, but it obviously depends on the availability of data in the oddities, including uh, the Commission. In terms of, of uh, climate objectives, that was mentioned that maybe we should report more often than at the end of a seven-year period. We have a number of audits in, in the climate sphere which are carried out by, mainly by our Chamber One. One actually is due to be published next year on climate targets specifically, and obviously part of ORF there's also a green tagging and, and a, 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 a specific percentage of expenditure which is supposed to be green, which obviously will be subject to audit. So finally, I would just like to take this uh, opportunity to thank the staff of the European Court of Auditors for still, despite the difficult working conditions post pre and post pandemic, of delivering more or less the full uh, our work programme uh, and uh, I think still at a very high quality despite all the challenges that, that we encountered. And lastly, I would like to just welcome Mr. Christopher to the court. He starts with us on the 1st of uh, November and we look forward to uh, an engagement in a different capacity. Thank you very much. Herzlichen Dank. Uh, Thank you very much. I wish you every success for your work in the Court of Auditors. I'd like to thank all members who have spoken in the debate, which now comes to an end.